Good morning YouTube, welcome back to the lab. So here we have episode 3. For those of you that have missed it, in episode 1 we built the IKEA Plate Reverb prototype. This was kind of a hacky prototype and a proof of concept. In episode 2 we went through the problems that we found in episode 1 and solved those problems one by one. And we ended up with a pretty good sounding plate reverb. Now, what I got a kick out of is that after the first episode, there were a number of people on the YouTube comments and in Reddit forums saying, this is never gonna work, I don't like the sound of it, this can't work well, this kind of stuff. And a few of those people after seeing episode two came back and said, you know what? This actually sounds pretty good. I take back what I said. So I think the moral of the story there is you shouldn't give up on ideas too soon. Sometimes you're only one or two small tweaks away from something that's actually pretty good. I've had a number of people ask me if I could create IR files for convolution reverbs, and I've actually been doing that for both versions of the plate, and I'm going to share those for free. The process itself is pretty interesting, so let me walk you through what convolution is and how it works, and then we'll meet back here and create a convolution of this plate. Let's talk about algorithms versus convolution. This is an example of an algorithm. I found this on the internet. There are many examples of algorithms. And this is the traditional way that digital reverb has been applied to signals, right? Usually what happens here is that there's a team of engineers, one or more DSP gurus and a lot of very smart people. They get into a room and they figure out, okay, we have a chip and it has so many cycles of processing power available. And here are the things that we can do. So these block diagrams, these functional block diagrams, basically represent all the things that that DSP will do to your signal as it flows through the DSP. These are things that have to be defined explicitly by people. So the engineers figure out there's a processor, it can do this, 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 and this, and we're going to arrange them in this way, route the signal back and forth. There's delay lines, there's feedback lines, there are filters, there are sometimes LFOs, there's all kinds of stuff that can happen to make a very pleasing sound. And this has been done by a number of companies. For example, Lexicon has been doing this for a very long time. Eventide has been doing this. There's about 30 years of know-how in this box. This thing is glorious. So this is how algorithm-based DSPs work. It's an inside-out approach. You take a look at a processor or your computer and you figure out how much can we squeeze out of this thing. And then you arrange the various building blocks to create the sound that you want to create. Okay? Convolution is fundamentally different. Convolution does not have a design approach like this where individual components have to be arranged and the flow of your signal has to be figured out by a group of experts. Convolution basically says, I have this black box. I have no idea what's going on in here. All I know is that I'm going to feed in a signal, an impulse, and I just want to take a look at the output, which we'll call the response. And by doing that, if you feed it an impulse and you analyze the response, you don't need to know what's going on in here. So you can go into a room and the example everybody uses for this is if you fire a starter pistol and it makes that instantaneous sound and you listen to the response of the room to that sound, now you have a response and then what you can do is take your new file whatever it is your new recording your new sound file and convolve it with the response so you take your new file you convolve it with the response and you get an output now the math involved in this is so far beyond my comprehension I'm not even gonna try to explain it the the people that work on this kind of stuff are math magicians as far as I'm concerned. What's interesting to note is that while convolution reverbs for professional audio have only been around for about 15 years, the idea of convolving one thing with another has actually been around since the 1700s. 
Mathematically, this is not something that is new. It's just that computers are finally able to process this stuff in real time and do it in a way that is musically pleasing, okay? Fascinating stuff. I'm sure there's other videos on YouTube explaining this in much more detail, but I think this is a good level of detail to know. Okay, let's take a break here. There's two ways of generating these impulses that you can capture the responses from. The first method is to actually have an impulse. What that means is you have a series of samples where it's all zero, and you have a single sample that is at full scale, and then more zeros after it. And you feed this into your, into your black box and look at what comes out. Now, this can work pretty well when you're dealing with something like an electronic or a digital box. If I wanted to capture a preset in this thing and convolve it, I could do that. I could feed something into its input and then monitor the output and see what I see. The problem is if you're using a transducer, this approach doesn't work very well. This is also known as the starter pistol approach. So for example, if I wanted to have a transducer like this and have it fire off a burst of white noise with all the frequencies that it can generate in one instant, literally for one sample, and then stop doing everything and become completely silent, this speaker, any speaker, is gonna struggle to do that. This is not something that is easy for speakers to do. Once they get moving, they don't wanna stop, and it's a big ask to have a speaker generate an instant impulse of all the sound frequencies and then stop. So, what a bunch of very smart people have figured out is instead of doing this in an instant, what you can do is actually sweep all the frequencies from low to high over a time. So instead of doing this as an instant pop, you can have a sweep where you go from all the frequencies from low to high, and what happens is you end up capturing all these sounds over time. And with additional processing, you can make it as if that signal happened all at once. Okay, so it's like having an impulse, except it can play out over time, which puts less stress over your speaker, your transducer, or the thing that has to actually make the sound. And once you have this, you can take any incoming signal that you have and convolve it with this and end up with a very nice sounding result. This sounds kind of complicated and frankly I think it is, but fortunately we don't need to worry about any of this. A lot of software applications, like for example Ableton, which I'm about to use, handle all of this stuff for you and you end up with a very nice output response that you can then use to convolve whatever it is that you like. So let's go ahead and do that. So here we've got the plate. It's set up exactly the same way as in episodes one and two. Same setup. I'm using the same recorder to capture everything and it's going into Ableton Live. I'd like to give a quick shout out to my friends over at Ableton for hooking me up with the latest version of Live. If you happen to own Ableton Live 9 or 10 Suite, you already have this IR measurement device, and this thing is great. It makes capturing these impulses super easy. Let me walk you through it. So we've got the channel setting set mono to stereo because we only have one speaker for the plate. The amp is set to negative 30 because the audio interface I use has a hot output and it clips the amp that I made if I set it to any louder than negative 30. So negative 30 it is. Sweep here is the time that it takes to perform a sweep. For this video, I've got it set to 10 seconds, but when I was doing the actual impulse responses that I'm sharing online, those ones I actually set to 60 seconds to get the highest possible quality. And the IR time I've got set to 10 seconds. Now this plate does not resonate anywhere close to 10 seconds. It's less than that. So 10 seconds is a safe bet. Now, as I mentioned in the last section, there's two ways of capturing impulses. There's the impulse method and the sweep method. The sweep method works really well when you're working with speakers or mechanical objects. And the impulse method tends to work really well if you're using electrical signals or digital signals to ping a device. Let's just hear what the impulse sounds like. And that's it.
I mean, that, that really is all there is to it. It's a single sample getting sent off to the plate and then 10 seconds of recordings being made from the plate to make sure that it is captured properly. And now let's do the sweep method. So there's the sweep. We wait for 10 seconds for the impulse response to ring out and that's it. We've captured an impulse of the plate. I leave the trim and normalize feature on all the time because unless you're going to do additional processing, you want your responses to be trimmed and normalized so you can just throw them into any convolution reverb and start working right away. And then just hit save. So we've got various different versions of the plates with different kinds of damping and I've got them open here in RX. Let's take a listen. Here's the plate with no damping version 1. Now you can see here all the high frequencies are cut and version 2 much better. Version 1 yeah much better. What about with a bit of damping? Here's version 1 with the scarf and a light box on it and similar amount of damping on plate version 2. Again, much more bright, and you can see the sustains last a lot longer than here, where only the low frequencies tend to sustain. Version 1, version 2, and finally, plate version number 1 with heavy damping. It's almost a dull thud, and here's the same thing, heavy damping with plate version number 2 much better. It's not a perfect sound. You can hear certain frequencies are really ringing. and You can see that in the spectrograph. It's most certainly not a perfect plate reverb, but I think it sounds good in use. And here we are in Cubase. Let's do this test one more time. Same routine as episodes one and two. We'll have addictive drums here. I'm going to play the same pattern you've heard before. Except this time we're going to play it through the convolutions of plate reverbs 1 and 2. And I'm going to use Cubase's stock Reverence plugin, which I can load our convolutions into. So let's go with uh, convolution version number 1 with no damping, just to hear what it sounds like. This should sound familiar if you've watched episode 1 kind of dull, all the high frequencies are gone. Now let's try number two. Again, no damping. All those high frequencies are back now. Now you'll notice I haven't done anything to the EQ settings. There's a bunch of other pre-delay type of settings and parameters that you can adjust, but I haven't touched anything. This is just the impulse exactly as it is at 100%. All right, so let's move on to Omnisphere here. I've got arpeggiated patterns just like before. This is IKEA Plate version 2 with heavy damping. What about IKEA plate reverb number two with medium damping? Same thing, no damping this time. this one from the last video. And it sounds a lot like the last video too, even though we're using a convolution this time. How about the
What if we switch to IKEA Plate Reverb version 1? With heavy damping this time, version 1. Raw sound. Okay, let's do one more. How about this one? It's the original. Let's try version two, no damping. more hi-fi sound. That was a little bit of damping. It's a dry sound. Get some of that plate back in there. There you have it, convolutions for the original and the second plates. I'm gonna leave links to both of those in the description below. So go download those. And if you come up with something cool, if you create a piece of music or art that you're really proud of using any of these convolutions, come back and share it with us. I always get a kick out of hearing where my products and projects and concepts end up. This is gonna be the last video that I make in 2018. It's been a wild ride. When I started this channel back in April, I had no idea so many people would be interested in any of these weird random prototypes that I'm creating, but it's really cool to have you along for the ride. I really appreciate all of the comments, all the subscribers, even the criticism. The constructive criticism has helped me kind of do a better job with this channel, and that's, uh, that's something that I appreciate very much. So, I hope you have a happy and healthy 2019, and I will see you in the next video.